We are going to talk a little bit about hacking airplanes without kind of making a mess about it. Uh, just, as an just an example, this is me on an aircraft heavily censored. I hope you can't really know, you know, where is it, what kind of aircraft is it. Uh, but just as a heads up, we are going to talk about like commercial uh, aviation. So I'm Zoltan. Um, I work for F-Secure as a, you know, computer toucher. Um, lately, we've been doing uh, quite a few aviation gigs in the past few years. And uh, this is my colleague, Ben. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, I'm Ben. Um, I'm working with, fe with uh, my fellow Sultan, so both at F-Secure. Um, I have a background in um, avionics and IT security, but currently I'm sick, so please bear with me if I'm talking some stupid things. Um, so basically this talk is based on a talk done by Andrea Barzani a while ago, so thanks and heads up to him as well for that. So basically, we're going to do a brief introduction into what are the root causes of miscommunication within the aviation industry and how these things are happening. Um, then we will give an overview of actually understanding the industry and how to actually collaborate with them and work with them in a good way and in a productive way. Um, so we will have some analyzed examples as well to show, and then we'll have some closing remarks afterwards. So basically, there has been quite a few years where there has been a lot of media coverage and thought around the um, aviation industry and how security is being done. And it's partly depending on that actually journalists who are actually publishing this information don't actually know security. And they might even less likely know cybersecurity from an aviation perspective, so they don't have necessarily the insights. And they might not be able to get the right information fr from within the industry or from within the experts in the industry. And especially like looking at the aviation world and how complex it is and how many stakeholders are involved and what these stakeholders are actually doing, they, the, the journalist or the media coverage most of the time is missing the whole picture and actually what's happening behind the curtains, which people sadly can't really talk about sometimes. And then as well, like if you look into researching communities, they sometimes just want to inflate the issues and as well, they don't necessarily do it on purpose because they might not know better, but it's hard for them to actually get this information from within the industry or from within like certain organizations which are there to help as well. So yeah, just a couple of words about how the industry actually looks like uh, from a bird's eye view, basically. Um, on this picture, we, you know, we found this picture in the Airbus Technical Magazine. Um, it's a pretty good summary of all the players that are involved in securing the skies, if you will. Um, so just an example, you have the operators, i.e. the airlines, you have the ANSPs, your ATCs and uh, uh, air navigation service providers. Um, you have your airports and you have all the manufacturers that work together to build said aircraft or just to supply additional uh, components for the operators to integrate onto their aircraft that they bought from the you know, manufacturers. And all of this is a really closely knit community, um, which is not really open uh, or hasn't been open so far uh, to external you know, input <laughs> as such. Um, hopefully this is going to change in the future uh, for the benefit of everyone. Um, but generally, uh, whenever there are issues uh, reaching the news and media, for example, the, these issues are very complex. And we are going to talk a little bit about the mitigation efforts that go into fixing these issues as well. And you'll see that those are not easy either. Um, so yeah. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, the industry is really entangled, so there's a lot of players involved, um, and each is dependent on the other. Uh, so whenever there's a vulnerability, let's say um, in, in an LRU, for example, that is supplied by one manufacturer, uh, it needs to be fixed there, and then it needs to be tested, certified, installed maybe even retested uh, in the whole integration uh, of the aircraft. And these things take time. Um, but we also get into the point where we learn a little about the domains. So yeah, basically, um, 
new aircraft like the Airbus A350 or the Boeing Dreamliner, they are designed with security in mind, and there's like certain implementations to actually separate these domains, um, which are like just to summarize from the I'm going to go from the right to the left. So from the most critical domain, the aircraft control domain, which is like literally like autopilot, flight controls, navigation systems. Then we have the airline information services domain which covers systems which are SATCOM, for example, as well as like whatever systems a pilot EFB or the cabin crew needs to use. And then there's a, like the passenger information, entertainment and services domain, which is the in-flight entertainment, the in-flight connectivity systems, which are actually being connected to the passenger himself than themselves. And these separations, uh, these, these domains are separated within the design and there's like, um, certain practices like um, domain separation being implemented, which we're going to cover on um, in a second. Um, so um, what I wanted to cover as well, just had to look at my notes. Um, so basically this is new aircraft, but there's like the legacy aircrafts which are like flying for already a few years, a few ten, tens of years, and they don't have necessarily this kind of domain separation. But again, they are not as connected and interconnected, and the systems are more um, isolated within the environment. And whenever there might be an update to the systems, for example, when they in add in-flight connectivity to a legacy aircraft, there are certain requirements and controls being implemented from from the manufacturers and suppliers to actually ensure that these additional connectivities functionalities don't actually expose the, the critical systems of the aircraft. So there are still some controls in place in that case as well. So to go a little bit more, bit more details on the domain separation. So in this example, I'm just going to show data diets, but there's other things like multiplexers and signal switching as well, how you can actually ensure that you are separating these domains. And obviously, you need bidirectional communication between domains, even though you might just mostly want to send data from the avionics control domains to the passenger domain. For example, everybody wants to see how where the plane is flying, how high you are, how fast you are. And this is all information coming from, from the aircraft control domain. But it's in a controlled manner that actually this is only flowing from the control domain to the passenger information service domain. And whatever connection you might have to have to get back, that's strictly controlled and tested independently as well to actually ensure that this is effectively implemented and separated. Yeah. So we just mentioned testing, right? Uh, the whole point of this talk is to give you an idea uh, about the hard work that is actually uh, happening behind the scenes that most people don't even realize. Um, and we've, as, as we mentioned, we've been doing some testing as well uh, for the past few years, so we kind of have an insight that we can share with you. Um, so basically when it comes to like certification of an aircraft and the security of any addition to an aircraft or during even the design and the uh, in, uh, building of an aircraft or any component on these planes, uh, there are some standards and guidelines that need to be taken into account. So everything is really well planned and, and all testing is performed uh, according to, for example, these uh, guidelines. Basically, you have the design assurance levels. Each component has their own design assurance level, uh, which basically dictates what would happen if that component would fail, right? So let's say uh, dial A uh, would be a catastrophic, like flight controls, FMS, things like that uh, would have a really high uh, uh, design assurance level and in turn in turn this connects to the security assurance level which these uh, components need to reach uh, during the certification process and this is where testing comes in uh, so again there's loads of testing involved uh, even internally but also externally um, so let's say you have a manufacturer they they, they do their own design they do some of their own testing um, but most a lot of the times they also do uh, third party testing which is you know better for everyone the more eyes you use uh, the more independent even eyes you use, the better results you'll have. Everyone thinks differently. Um, so basically this is what happens. And when it comes to security assurance level uh, testing, it's also important to remember that everything is planned into the testing activities that would have uh, like from an integration perspective. Let's say you have different components with different SAL levels, and the higher the SAL, the higher integrity, the more critical the system is, uh, and it is ensured during testing that lower integrity, lower trusted, uh, or like less trusted components cannot really uh, 
send messages or control higher criticality uh, components. So there is no, for example, uncontrolled uh, communication between a SAT zero uh, to a SAT three or two uh, component. And everything, again, is, is planned. Um, so how are these activities performed? Well, this is where uh, aviation is not different at all from your reg regular security testing, really. Uh, you start with attack surface mapping, you do risk analysis, um, and then you build some threat scenarios, uh, and then you test, start testing. So this is like a mix of everything, really. You have to think about procedures, you have to think about um, physical security and when you actually do like the you know computer touchy testing uh, you start from the hardware layer um, to up to like the higher levels of software so as Ben already mentioned for example when you uh, you're, when you're testing domain separation um, you're looking at schematics you, you're looking at the implementation of those hardware diodes those signal switches those multiplexers and you ensure that the communication is controlled, filtered, and only the thing that needs to go through actually goes through, right? Um, and whenever you're doing like unit testing, so the independent component testing, you always assume that the lower tier uh, cell components that they are connected to are compromised, right? That's that's the base assumption. That's uh, when doing security testing, you always use the worst case scenario, um, so you get you know higher grades of security. Um, and this is also one of the challenges. So unit testing is one thing when you take one component, test it on, it own, on its own, but when you actually integrate it into an aircraft or any other system in the aviation sector or anywhere else, anywhere else really, this is not different from any other security testing practice. Uh, integration testing can be very difficult because there's um, lots of you know, NDAs, there's lots of intellectual property, there's lots of different companies starting to work together, but they're also selling stuff to each other and they need to ensure that their property is their property and no unauthorized access is reached. Um, and then when you have third parties coming in testing your stuff, you also need to be careful about you know, what kind of accesses you give. And this is also an opportunity or like one of those hazards that are uh, in the aviation industry uh, when approached from security perspective that these things can take time and things might fall through the cracks and this is where it's very important to you know keep a sharp eye on and and better like openness to some extent uh, would be needed uh, in the industry as a, in, in general um, and you also have to remember that realistically there is no such thing as a hundred percent secure right you can do testing with the best hardware hackers in the world, uh, which you actually kind of have, <laughs> um, but they even, even then you have time limitations, you have uh, visibility limitations, you might not have you know, a white box access or like source code access or full design access to all the connected components that you're testing. There is, you know, uh, you, 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 cannot always, you cannot always know what kind of data you might receive on the you know, buses, be it CAN, Air Inc, uh, Ethernet, whatever. Um, so you have to do fast testing, which takes time, and projects have time limitations again. So it's, it's complex. So there's no such thing as 100% secure. Uh, it's all about mitigating to the risk to the lowest possible. So um, just to go a bit more detail, uh, detailed about the security engineering efforts actually which are done in aviation. So basically this, this picture nicely represents like this uh, Swiss cheese model which is kind of like you normally have more than one control in, in place within security, so within aviation security. So basically during the design and development phase you, you define your criticality of your system actually what interfaces you have, how exposed the system is going to be and where it's actually allocated in the architecture and then you have to define what kind of controls do you actually need to have? So as we've seen before, there might be for Dell A systems, for example, that you need to have a SAL3 and a SAL2 security assurance level implementation. So you need two independent controls implemented within this architecture or this interface to actually have some kind of insurance that you're on a secure side in, in, in these kind of things. And so basically this involves requirements capturing risk assessments as well as like the hardware, hardware software design and actually seeing like how do you actually implement these, these solutions and what kind of tools are you using. Then in the integration phase basically these all these systems are coming together so 
you, as an aircraft manufacturer or integrator, you don't just do everything yourself. So you're depending a lot, a whole lot on suppliers and third parties, which are actually designing the systems. And you might just commercial buy commercial of the shelf uh, systems. So basically, you need to ensure that your definitions of controls are actually being implemented, and that you actually can test them as well to actually have this assurance. For then, if you go into the deployment phase, so actually when the operator is using this aircraft, so basically you're not done with security because the plane is going to fly potentially for 30, 40, 50 years maybe even. So you need to ensure that like the operator, the airline actually knows how to actually use the aircraft not only from a safety perspective but also from a security perspective. So what kind of environment they have to set up, how they have to um, secure this environment and ensure that actually like the aircraft is staying in a state you have defined. And as well, like when it comes to vulnerabilities, you have to have a solution which actually like ensures that whenever you find vulnerabilities or the operator runs across a problem, that this is actually reported to you and you can actually investigate what's being done. And obviously, this involves as well continuous testing and vulnerability management to actually see where are you with your current system and what actually vulnerabilities you're facing, what new threats you're facing. And just one second. Um, so yeah, ba basically it's like you're having a long exposure time and you need to make sure that during this whole operation of the aircraft you actually can ensure that it stays secure. Um, so we are going to have three small examples. Um, I'm going to start off with um, something from the aircraft control domain. So basically it's like a CAN bus which is allocated in, in the um, safety critical environment. And as we have heard before, like this CAN bus is quite quite frequently used on an aircraft, especially on um, like um, com um, personal, uh, like general aviation, but as well, like there are some implementations in commercial um, aircraft as well. But um, basically, there's like a CAN aerospace uh, definition, which is kind of like the CAN definition for safety critical environment in the aerospace industry. And most of the time, these CAN buses are only used to complement other safety critical protocols, for example, like Airing 429 or AFDX. Um, so most likely, if you have a CAN bus on an aircraft, this is not directly connected to the whole avionics domain, but it's just like in a segregated environment. Uh, even though it's in a safety domain, it's segregated from the rest of the avionics on a commercial aircraft. Um, but there are still like threat scenarios you, you might have. So basically, you have the maintenance phases where you rip apart the whole aircraft and take out nearly everything of the aircraft and just like do the whole uh, maintenance work. There's insider threats which could have access to the CAN bus and tamper it. And these, these are parts of the risk analysis analysis which are being done um, during the design of the aircraft. And these are things which are being accounted for. So basically, if you have one of these uh, CAN buses exposed within, for example, a more um, in a, if it's uh, in a more exposed environment, somewhere in the cabin or close to the cabin, um, you can make, you can be sure that this interface, this CAN bus interface, is actually being identified during the, the design of the system or the design of the aircraft, and it's actually being tested and most likely, or not most likely, but it's not going to have a safety impact with, for, on, on the operation of the aircraft, because if it would have a safety impact and if it would be exposed somewhere for somebody to be able to access that, this aircraft would not be flying because it wouldn't be allowed to do that. It wouldn't receive the certification. All right. Uh, another example that we've seen, um, or and that is really relevant, especially in the newer aircraft, um, which is in the airline information system, uh, services domain, uh, which is basically the data loading process and the data loaders themselves. Uh, they're in the cockpit, of course, uh, used during maintenance to you know push software parts, updates basically to to certain LRUs, to certain components in the ACD, even sometimes. Um, and this is this is of course one. Of of those things that needs rigorous testing. You wouldn't want to have you know, uh, anything compromised uh, during the update process. Just imagine your iPhone downloading and installing a compromised update. Um, so things similar to an iPhone update are in place uh, for a newer aircraft when it comes to data loading. That is you know, also dependent on the manufacturer that is also dependent on the operator actually so each manufacturer has their own processes for um, data loading and each and they still 
can't control everything, so that also means handing over control to the airlines uh, operating those aircraft at some point, and that and then it also becomes the responsibility of the airline itself to secure further the data loading environment. And in newer uh, aircraft, those data loading environments are e-enabled, uh, which basically means they use modern uh, media, so not just floppies, they're still used, by the way, uh, 3.5 inch floppies, for example, but now you have also USB sticks. Um, you also have Wi-Fi, you have cellular, and you have Ethernet through like a maintenance laptop that you can connect to the cockpit. Uh, all of uh, these transport media can be used uh, to install the data loads, and each has their own security risks, right? Uh, let's say, like, stay, taking a USB stick, how do you send a data load to an airport, for example, which is not in your home country, uh, but where you have maintenance presence? You need to ensure the physical safety of the USB stick itself. And here, non-technical or less technical controls come into place. And I know this is DAF CON and it's not that technical, but just bear with me. But imagine putting the USB stick in a sealed, tamper-proof envelope. That's already a control, right? And of course, on top of that, you have an encrypted pen drive. You have your data loads signed and those signatures checked um, multiple steps along the way, uh, last of which is the data loader itself on the aircraft, right? Uh, and these are all you know, considered. These are all tested. Threat scenarios are uh, drawn up and tested. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of work going on in the background. Um, and then, yes, you still have your insider threats and you have your external threats. Like, let's say you have uh, data loading on modern aircraft using cellular networks. Um, you know, airplane pulls up to the gate uh, while people are, well, maybe not done, but during the nightly maintenance uh, phase, you have engineers not even leaving the airport because it's, let's say, it's like, you know, above the Arctic Circle and it's freaking cold. So they just use these gatling technologies to push updates and in those cases wi-fi and cellular networks need to be secured uh, and not just again the net uh, the channel itself but also the updates uh, different procedures and those updates need to come from the manufacturer through servers that are hosted with the airline and the airlines need to secure those servers as well again lots of risk lots of testing going into these things um, not always to the fullest extent, again, because of all the different partners, uh, parties, inter, uh, intellectual, intellectual property and things like that, but there is a lot of work going on. And you have to also remember that Swiss cheese model that Ben showed you. And our last example, um, probably one of the easiest one to imagine, um, let's say you have an aircraft with like in-flight entertainment and connectivity, basically your little screens and your Wi-Fi on board during flight. Uh, these things are the main things that reach m the media when there is anything like either vulnerability or not even the vulnerability, just you know some miscommunication going on. Um, so these things have the most exposure when it comes to like the general passengers, right? Um, so when it comes to like the threat modeling of, of a component, IFEs and IFCs, which are in the PIESD, uh, um, uh, have different threat scenarios. More exposure means more people to attack these systems or try to attack these systems. And even the less likely scenarios uh, will have a higher risk potentially because of the media presence. But you have to uh, think about uh, back to the DAL and SAL levels, um, I forgot to mention, but basically we can also um, identify two distinct categories of risks, security risks. One is safety, one is brand. The previous two examples that we've shown have a safety impact as well. So these are the DAL A through D, basically, categories with security assurance levels three to one, and cell zero and DAL E, which is like, if there is a failure, there is no safety impact, um, and these are the least trusted components, Enter, enter IFEC, again, completely, usually, uh, or should be as separate as possible from the ACD. Of course, there is some communication, but that is only, uh, or should be only unidirectional, um, but these are most exposed. So these are taken into account when test scenarios are done. Um, and in these cases, it's usually the, well, 
it's either the airline or the manufacturer who orders these tests. Again, we are from uh, a consulting company, so you know we have this like third-party perspective. Uh, we are not bound as such by the burden of information that is present when it comes to like the design and, and the manufacturing of these things. Um, so we have a clear set of eyes uh, on these, um, and we also help. Uh, draw up these threat scenarios and in these cases again as I mentioned the brand and reputation risk when it comes to the airline itself is the most important which means that you do you don't necessarily want your IFE and IFC to go down during flight people would get mad and you know scream hackers um, or you don't want your paid Wi-Fi to be bypassed so people would you know bypass your whole payment process and have free Wi-Fi on the on the inter uh, on your flight or maybe you do and you don't care mu too much about that. It's, it's you know, like a, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's a case by case basis um, for different airlines. <coughs> excuse me. Um, and you have privacy concerns as well. You don't want your credit card information to leak out uh, to unauthorized third parties or PII, um, personal be identified information. Sorry. Uh, some water. Uh, excuse me, my voice is going away a little bit. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Much better. All right, so um, IFE, IFCs don't usually have a safety impact. So you have to think about that too when you're reading news about it. That if there is a vulnerability or the you know there might not be a vulnerability but usually these don't have any safety impact of an aircraft otherwise they would not be flying right um, and just a couple of words about all the mitigation efforts that go into finding and actually fixing these vulnerabilities um, in our experience at least uh, we've always had good responses from all the projects we did Either, even if it was for a third party so you know we are consultants we are uh, approached by our clients who might be using uh, third-party software and components uh, that they want to test because they are integrating it into their environment and we of course send the report to our clients who would in turn send it forward to the actual manufacturer and again in our experience the response was always positive uh, of course findings are challenged sometimes we might not have the full picture but again this is a team effort between us our clients and the manufacturer or if the client is the manufacturer then it's just you know one step easier um, but you also have to consider that there's certification processes in place. You can't just push an OTA update and expect your IFE, even your IFE without safety impact, uh, to have updated overnight. These, these, these things take months, literally like half a year at least, um, for a patch to be pushed out when it comes to like a security issue or, or some operational uh, issue. Um, and again, the flow of information can be better <laughs> uh, between the operators, between the third parties. Uh, sometimes the mitigation effort is further hindered, apart from the certification uh, process, um, by, by the limited flow of information, um, which in our uh, mind is a, is a bit of a room for improvement. All right, yeah going towards the, the future work of how actually the industry can improve even more. So as we experience, we have a lot of like contracts with suppliers, manufacturers, operators, and it's really difficult to talk about it. So we, we would like to talk more technical, obviously, at this event. But yes, contractual agreements just don't allow us to be more transparent. And it would be nice to see that there's like more collaboration, especially between OEMs and operators. So if the manufacturer would more collaborate with the with the airline for example to actually share the risks they identified before and so actually that the the airline itself can actually use these this is knowledge actually to their advantage as well um, and as well if it comes to to testing it's always difficult to find agreements between third parties and OEMs or operators to actually agree on how the testing can be done what can be done because at the end it's a certified system and having access to like an environment a lab environment or actually testing equipment it can be really challenging and this is something where it would be really useful to have more collaboration to actually involve everybody who has the knowledge and the skills and the expertise to actually work on these things and obviously since 
like I mentioned before, air aircraft are flying really long. Like the first, air the the oldest aircraft still flying are probably like 40, 50 years old, and they are still being used by by airlines. And obviously, there needs to be continuous vulnerability management and testing being involved to actually see that these um, systems are actually future proof and actually can be used in the future as well. And integrating new technologies that this is actually being done in a secure manner. Um, so basically there's there's some efforts within the industry and I think like a few people already have um, run across for example the aviation ISAC or on the European side the ECCSA which are actually like consortia of industry partners and regulators to actually see where like to actually use this knowledge of researchers to actually share the insights and as well like there's working groups working together within the industry to actually define standards or like to def define guidelines how to actually do security within the aviation industry so the the final point we want to make um, as part of the presentation is that there's like actually more uh, security efforts being done in the aviation industry that is normally perceived. Like we said, it's hard to share these insights and actually to, to talk about it openly. But we can say that there's like a lot being done behind the curtains and that there's a lot of efforts being implemented and actually that there's like a lot of collaboration going on as well within the industry and as well with external parties. Yeah, and uh, you also have to remember to use that pinch of salt uh, more frequently when you're reading news and you know you're talking to or um, hearing about vulnerabilities. Some, uh, well, I don't want to question the research effort that goes into this because there are amazing research uh, by independent researchers into the in the aviation sector. Uh, what we try to say is that they might not have the full picture, right? The vulnerabilities that they find, the bugs, the actual like technical bugs they find are correct and you know true. Again, there is no such thing as a 100% secure system. But when it comes to the uh, extrapolation of those issues for the whole sector or even just the aircraft or the airline itself, there, there might be some you know, things that need uh, some second thoughts and maybe some further input. Uh, again, if there would be security issues uh, that would impact the safety of flights, those planes would not be flying, right? With some, you know, there's always an exception to the rule, but generally the, the industry is very much hard at work to increase the security of these aircraft. And it's been an increasing effort over the past few years. It's much better now than it was four years ago uh, when it comes to the openness and the involvement of all the parties uh, towards uh, like security controls uh, when it comes to like cyber security. Sorry for cursing, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, because security can also be physical, which is, you know, a big part of airlines and, and aviation in general. Um, but the IT security risks are relatively new and the effort's been increasing and, and it's better and better every day and month and year. Uh, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, and again, uh, just, yeah, everything is better than expected, I guess, or, or like most people would like to think. And uh, that was us. Um, I think we did it a bit, little bit faster than we planned to. Uh, but if you have any questions, either ask here. We have like 15 more minutes, or we'll be around as well. But let's start here. Yeah? What are your thoughts on our friend Chris Roberts' planes? Uh, controlling the airplane from a seat and getting Yeah. So the question was, what are our thoughts about Chris Roberts' claims about controlling the uh, aircraft through the IFE? Uh, we have no comments on that. <laughs> yep. You mentioned that the domain separation is kind of a recent phenomenon. Like how recent are we talking about? So the question was that uh, we mentioned that the domain separation is relatively recent in, in aircraft manufacturing and how recent are we talking here. So basically what we have to say is that there is two type of aircraft like legacy and, and you know new generation, e-enabled, whatever you want to call it. Uh, as a couple of examples, A350 is considered a new generation aircraft. So is the uh, 787 from Boeing for example. All of these are designed sep uh, differently than the aircraft that was that 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 their original designs were from the 60s and 70s, uh, which are like examples like A320, 737, you know. But again, when when we are talking even legacy aircraft, 
and there's new component like the e-enabled component put on these aircraft, there's a certification process, there's a lot of testing going on with the different uh, view as opposed to like the completely separated uh, aircraft. And again, legacy aircraft has less of an attack surface because they come with less uh, you know, connect, connected uh, components. Any more questions? Then uh, thank you for attending this talk. I hope you, you know, leave with a bit more positive attitude towards aviation security than you came in with. And uh, see you around. <laughs> thank you.